talk about a little bit uh, about surveillance in trauma patients, um, specifically in high-risk patients. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, Dr. McKeever already mentioned Verkau's triad. You know, the endothelial injury, stasis, and hypercoagulable state are pretty common in trauma, and in our patients, after major trauma, there's thrombosis often in the major veins in the legs that then propagates and embolizes, landing up in the lungs and leading to PE. This is the, the pathophysiology described as far back as 1856. It's been a major cause of death in trauma patients uh, for you know, the last 140 years as well. The incidence ranges quite a bit from 5 to 63 percent in different studies, depending on which patients you're looking at, how they're getting prophylaxed, and methods of detection. And uh, as Dr. McKeever said, there's significant morbidity and mortality in injured patients uh, and hospitalized patients in general. Initially, DVTs are always diagnosed either on autopsy or on uh, contrast venography, but uh, increasing availability, low cost, and low invasiveness of ultrasound has made it by far the dominant method uh, for diagnosing this. So lower extremity screening duplex ultrasounds for asymptomatic patients were proposed to identify DVTs early before they progressed to pulmonary embolism. There's been a significant increase uh, in the interest over time, especially in the last two or three decades, on VTE in trauma patients, both in the trauma community and in uh, the overall health community. So the bottom left uh, graph here is from the recent consensus conference on optimizing VTE prophylaxis in trauma patients and shows the number of publications per year for trauma and DVT, trauma and PE, uh, and trauma and VTE. Uh, you can see the right side of that graph really skyrocketing there. So there's almost an exponential increase in the number of papers written per year about this. As awareness increased and people became more interested in VTE and preventing it, uh, many hospitals initiated their own guidelines to who they should screen with ultrasound, um, whether it was all trauma patients, no trauma patients, select patients, trying to prevent DVT, or sorry, diagnose DVT early and prevent the complications largely from PE. Uh, in 2008, the U.S. Surgeon General put out a call to action to prevent DVT and VTE, not just for trauma, but for all patients. Ultimately, the consequence of this was agencies like the AHRQ, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the uh, Joint Commission sort of defined in-hospital DVT and PE as a preventable patient safety uh, event meaning it was directly tied both to compensation uh, and to accreditation, and that there were punitive uh, issues that could occur if VTE rates were high. These punitive issues made people start questioning how much we should be screening and whether we were really improving things for people. There's a lot of different groups that worked on this and a lot of great publications, but uh, there's a series here by Elliot Hout and his colleagues at Johns Hopkins that I think really illustrates this well. They first looked at uh, an institutional policy at Hopkins where they had started a new screening policy uh, to catch more DVTs. They found that with their new policy, comparing before and after, they were doing four times as many ultrasounds, but diagnosing ten times as many DVTs. Uh, the, their PE rate during this time increased as well, but not by a significant amount. So they wondered if this was just a problem with them or uh, a wider spread thing. They turned to the National Trauma Data Bank the next year and divided hospitals at trauma centers into quartiles for how much they did ultrasound, what percent of trauma patients got a DVT ultrasound, and found that the highest quartile hospitals had seven times more DVTs than the lower three quartiles. <coughs> uh, after presenting this at the, the national meeting and getting asked some questions about patient risk factors, uh, they proceeded the next year to look back at the NTDB and showed that even when they controlled for all the patient level risk factors, Patients at hospitals that did more ultrasounds were twice as likely to have DVTs than those who didn't. Um, so overall, they, they thought this represented a significant surveillance bias, as seen in the second paper, where the rate of DVT was actually not controlled by the risk factors or by the patients, but by the methodology for screening. Um, you know, the more you look, the more you find, as they said in, the, in their paper. So given that this was a uh, you know, could have consequences with Medicare reimbursement, uh, and there was no national standards at this time for what to do, a number of other studies came out looking at routine screening for all trauma patients. And the moral of that story was routine ultrasound for all trauma patients results certainly in increased detection of DVTs, uh, which sort of ironically for the hospitals doing it uh, ultimately means from a Medicare or uh, joint commission perspective, it's a decreased quality of care because you have a higher percent of DVTs diagnosed at your institution.
Uh, so you're shooting yourself in the foot a little bit there. And there's really no definitive evidence that this actually improves the rate of PEs uh, or the rate of mortality from pulmonary embolism, certainly had significantly increased costs. So this was not recommended. The next thought was maybe we should just do high risk patients. Should we somehow select which trauma patients are even higher risk than others? And what if we just screened them? We'd have lower costs and maybe a higher yield from this. There's a couple of uh, specific scoring systems. Dr. McKeever again mentioned the Caprini score, which is a great uh, VTE risk system, but doesn't apply specifically to trauma patients. So the trauma embolic scoring system, or TESS, uh, is relatively easy to use in one way, that it's only five factors, uh, the age, the ISS, obesity, ventilator use, and lower extremity fractures, and showed some promise. The major downside to it is that ISS is not calculated when a patient's admitted. You can't look at them in the trauma bay and say, this patient needs screening or not. Um, and so this is not used quite as frequently. The risk assessment profile by Greenfield and his colleagues uh, has a lot more factors, 16 things, including patient history, whether they have a history of malignancy or prior VTE, uh, atrogenic factors, like how many blood products they had transfused, injury-related factors, which do include abbreviated injury scores, uh, and age. Uh, this has been used quite a bit more. It's still a little bit cumbersome to calculate in real time, but it can be done. Uh, and while originally in the first paper, greater than five was considered high risk, most studies now use greater than 10. So there's been a number of studies, uh, mostly in recent years, looking at patients that are just high risk who are screened. And this includes actually the first ever randomized controlled trial of ultrasound screening for high risk patients that came out in 2021. Uh, and this has been able to show that while, again, you have increased rates of DVT, uh, there's actually decreased rates of pulmonary embolism in this group. And due to that, uh, it might be cost effective in terms of quality adjusted life years gained. None of these studies are big enough with the low rates of PE, uh, even in our high risk patients, that there's been an effect of mortality. They're just not powered for that. There's also been, uh, in recent years, a number of challenges to the original Verkaus model. <laughs> So in different studies, both from database studies and including one uh, you know, very extensive cadaver dissection done by the LA County Coroner, coroner uh, in conjunction with the group here at LA General, a significant chunk, 23 to 84% of pulmonary embolisms actually don't have an associated DVT. Uh, they're unable to find one. Systemic review and meta-analysis also showed, looking at 23 different studies, that there was no correlation between the percentage of DVTs and the percentage of PEs. So where are these, these MLI coming from? Uh, that's led some people to propose pulmonary thrombosis as a separate entity from PE and say, especially potentially in patients with chest trauma, maybe these clots are forming directly in the lungs and not embolizing from the legs. You would never pick that up on a screening ultrasound. You're not gonna be able to prevent that uh, in the same way as you would our traditional model. Um, there's been some evidence to show that the risk factors for pulmonary thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and DVT have some overlap, certainly, like major trauma, but also some distinct risk factors, and that might be why these risk assessment tools we have so far in our screening tools don't really work well. There's not really ever been a clear consensus on this. I wish I could give you a straight answer at the end of the talk, but this is from a 2011 study, uh, again, by Elliot Hout and uh, a number of other people where they surveyed both trauma centers and individual trauma surgeons from AAST and East. And from 300 and something uh, trauma attendings, about 75% agreed that high risk asymptomatic trauma patients should be screened for DVT, but only one third of them agreed that there was actually published data that existed to support the opinion they held. Um, I'm not sure that the needle has moved too much on this in the last 10 years, uh, although certainly we're making a little bit of progress in the high risk groups. There's you know, thinking about what the experts think, uh, there's five committees out, or five groups out there from major trauma organizations that have guidelines, uh, many of whom have been contributed to by people in this room. Uh, East, the American College of Chest Physicians, Western Trauma, AAST Critical Care Committee, and the ACSCOT. All five of these agree that screening ultrasound is not recommended for asymptomatic trauma patients who don't score as high risk for VTE. Uh, the majority of them say that you could at least consider, uh, some very strong language there, uh, a weekly ultrasound in asymptomatic trauma patients who are high risk for VTE, and then Western trauma and uh, AAST add the caveat of only those who can't be on pharmacologic prophylaxis. Generally, the risk assessment profile is the best thing we have right now, and three out of the, the five recommendations involve using that, usually with a score of 10. So my takeaways from all this, 
early and adequate pharmacologic VT prophylaxis, you'll hear more about that, uh, I think, from Dr. Lay tomorrow, uh, should be implemented in all high-risk trauma patients. This is probably the most crucial factor here. Don't screen all your asymptomatic patients, um, especially not the low-risk ones, but anyone you can give adequate pharmacologic prophylaxis to is probably not going to benefit significantly from screening. In the people who are unsafe to receive pharmacologic prophylaxis, your TBIs with ongoing bleeding or public bleeding, ongoing oozing requiring transfusion, and you can't give them DVT prophylaxis, they might benefit from a screening ultrasound. Uh, but obviously, we need some more research here to, to solve this question. Uh, thank you to all my, my mentors here and for inviting me up to give this talk. And then a uh, big thank you to my family for allowing me the time to come here and give this and to work on this. Uh, those are my newborn twins at home, Wyatt and Ezra. <laughs>